and welcome to From the EBPL Archives, encore presentations from the East Brunswick Public Library. I am your host, Melissa Hozik. This event was graciously funded by the East Brunswick Friends of the Library. To learn more about the Friends or make a donation, visit ebpl.org forward slash friends. Now, enjoy the program. Wiener is an award-winning journalist and recognized global expert on the politics of sports business. He's got a video podcast. He does a lot of writing. So you're going to get a lot of great information. He's talked with some of the people that you will, you know, directly with whom he'll be sharing their stories about this evening. So thank you, Evan, and welcome. And thank you, Melissa, for inviting me to the library. My name is Evan Wiener. I've been doing this type of thing since 1971, uh, Spring Valley High School. I started and uh, it was the high school um, radio show that was on a commercial station, WRKL. Joe Dionisio was uh, my teacher. Hey, student, you got a good voice. How would you like to be on radio? Yeah, the worst way. And I was terrible show. And he also opened the door for me to write for the Hackensack Bergen Record and uh, the Nyack Journal News. And he still calls me student 49, 50 years later, but we still talk. Um, I worked at WNEW and um, I, I did news for them. Uh, among the things I covered for them was uh, interviewing Ronald Reagan along with the Iranian hostages. And it's a good segue for me to talk about WNEW because uh, that guy there, Phil Sims, uh, Phil was the quarterback of the New York Giants. Of course, he was the MVP of the 1986-87 game where they beat Denver out in Pasadena. Uh, but here I am with him back in 1982 when they were on WNEW. And uh, Phil was too busy, too busy eating his banana. And every once in a while, I'll see Phil, I'll still ask him, he's still eating bananas? And he said, I'd rather do that than talk to you. But I've known Phil for over 40 years now. So we get along well, but he's left-handed, except he throws right-handed. So he's a little odd, but he was an MVP of the Super Bowl. And the Super Bowl is America's excuse to party in February, except this year because of COVID. Uh, but how the Super Bowl came about is kind of a rather interesting and convoluted story because it was literally an act of Congress that created the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl was created uh, after Congress passed legislation which allowed the merger of the American Football League and the National Football League. The bill was tacked on to an anti-inflation Bill. The merger bill was tacked on to an anti-inflation bill because who's going to vote for inflation? Nobody. So just throw it on the back of that as a rider and you got it passed. And it's signed into law by Lyndon Johnson on November 8th, 1966. Uh, before I get into how the Super Bowl became the Super Bowl, I want to talk a little bit about how much it well, I can't tell you how much it cost to make sure that the Super Bowl in Tampa last year or last February was secure or the Super Bowl in South Florida uh, in 2020 was secure. Uh, but uh, it's the United States Secret Service. that's the lead agency that uh, makes sure the Super Bowl goes off without a hitch. Uh, the Super Bowl is a SEER 1 level event, meaning that it's a special events assessment rating level one. There are 50 agencies who have been working, who worked for a year and a half prior to the Super Bowl. Uh, they started in Tampa in, uh, say, um, September of uh, September 2019. Uh, and rather, they started in South Florida, September 2019, and then Tampa after that. Uh, so they've worked for a year and a half. There's no word for uh, on how much money it costs taxpayers to provide security. Uh, the NFL doesn't pay any money to help secure their crown jewel event where they make a ton of money. Uh, some of the agencies underneath the Secret Service includes the FBI, FEMA, TSA, the Customs and Border Patrol and local police. When the uh, Super Bowl was up in East Rutherford in 2014, the New Jersey State Police were very, very heavily involved to make sure that that game at the Meadowlands was secure. So how did we get to the Super Bowl? Well, these guys who look like they're at an airport actually helped bring the Super Bowl about. That's Butch Bird on the right. 
Uh, the guy in the fedora that you can recognize is a guy named Earl Faison. I don't know who this guy is uh, leaning down uh, with his hand over his face, but the guy next to him in the fedora looking like he's holding airline tickets is Curtis McClinton, who played with Kansas City. Faison played with San Diego Bird with Buffalo. And uh, if you think that they're at the airport for a reason, they are. They're leaving New Orleans. Uh, let's take a look at the quick background of how the Super Bowl came together. Civil Rights Act, August 7th, 19, rather July 7th, 1964. Uh, Jim Crow, New Orleans, a player's boycott. Senator Russell Long, Representative Hale Boggs, Cokie Roberts' father. Uh, the Brooklyn representative, Emanuel Seller, all part of the Super Bowl creation more by accident than design, but all of these factors came together to put together what we now know as America's February celebration, the reason to party the Super Bowl. That's Ron Mix, Ron Mix, uh, who played with the uh, Los Angeles slash San Diego Chargers uh, in the American Football League between 1960 and 1969. And uh, years ago, uh, 1997, uh, Ron and I uh, got together in San Diego to talk about a bunch of things, including this. And uh, then I caught up with him seven years ago when the Los Angeles Clippers players in the National Basketball Association, uh, they were talking about uh, boycotting the NBA playoffs because their owner, Donald Sterling, um, said a number of uh, hurtful things, let's put it that way, to his mistress, who recorded it and then gave it to TMZ and the whole thing broke loose and the players heard it and they were about ready to boycott the playoffs. Ron Mix was part of the American Football League players boycott of the 1965 New Orleans uh, uh, All-Star Game. And it is that game that propelled or set into motion the Super Bowl. Mix told me we were aware that New Orleans was hosting the game to demonstrate to the American Football League and the National Football League they, New Orleans, could support a football franchise. The last thing we wanted to do was assist them in demonstrating they could support a franchise. A boycott was the only alternative for the players. But it wasn't the first time American Football League players boycotted New Orleans or boycotted in the South. That's Walter Beach. Walter is still around. Uh, Walter has got to be now in his 80s. Um, and he's been a civil rights activist. He was a football player, graduated uh, Central Michigan University. And in 1960, he's drafted by the Boston Patriots of the American Football League. In 1961, the Boston Patriots uh, are supposed to play a preseason game in New Orleans and Walter Beach. Uh, is right in the middle of what is going on right now in terms of, right, or then I should say, uh, with the civil rights movement, particularly in the South. And Walter Beach, um, is this guy, oh, <laughs> uh, Walter Beach uh, was um, labeled a troublemaker by Billy Sullivan, who owned the Boston Patriots and his uh, uh, coach, Mike Holovac. See, Walter Beach was fired by the Boston Patriots in 1961. He was labeled a troublemaker for organizing a protest among black players against the segregated living conditions during the team's road trip, which was just a day to New Orleans. Beach told the Patriots uh, brass, he said, I, I expect to go down to New Orleans. I want to stay with my teammates. I want to eat with my teammates. I don't want to go to the other side of town. I don't want to live with a host family. I'm a professional football player. This is what I want to do. And he was labeled as a troublemaker. And that was the end of Walter Beach with the New England Boston Patriots. He ended up playing with the Cleveland Browns in 1962. He was part of the Cleveland Browns championship team in 1964. And in 1967, when Muhammad Ali refused to go into the military, he was one of the people called, it was called the Cleveland Summit. Uh, Jim Brown was there, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was there, my friend Flea Roberts was there, and they decided uh, to listen to Ali, whether he was legitimate or not as a conscientious objector to the uh, joining the military back in 1967. And he's continued his uh, life as, a, uh, as somebody who is fighting for civil rights. Uh, another South 
strike, so to speak, uh, led by uh, Fred the Hammer Williamson, Clem Daniels, Art Powell with the Oakland Raiders. Uh, in 1963, the Oakland Raiders and the New York Jets were supposed to play a game in Mobile, Alabama. Alabama, segregation. Uh, it is Mobile. It is August 1963. Six African-American members of the Oakland Raiders refused to play in an exhibition game against the Jets at Ladd Stadium. Why? Well, it had segregated seating. And, of course, there was a Jim Crow South, so the six players said, we're not playing here. We're not staying here. Mobile hosted three prior American Football League preseason games. Al Davis, AD, was the coach of the Oakland Raiders, and he stood by his six players. Uh, they never played the game in Mobile. The game was moved to Oakland. Mobile had hosted three prior American Football League preseason games, 1960, 61, 62. They never hosted another game there. And there is AD, Al Davis, uh, who was a rookie coach back in 1963, who stood by his players. The players were Clem Daniels who is also in New Orleans, Art Powell, Bo Robertson, Fred the Hammer Williamson, Proverb Jones, and Eugene White. They all said no. Al Davis said, uh, I'm going with them. Uh, what was the halftime entertainment of the first Super Bowl? A college marching band. And there is uh, Mobile, Alabama, and it's called Lad Peebles Stadium now. Uh, the AFL and the NFL never returned there. Uh, the Mobile Stadium official said, we don't want uh, four boys from Oakland telling us how to run our stadium. We're going to integrate quietly. Now, we're going to go ahead, as in the past, for other exhibition games here. That was real. Schussler, Jr., who is the stadium manager, they never had a game. Daniels, who was with the American Football League guys, said, I wanted to play in Mobile before an integrated crowd and contribute in a small way to breaking down uh, these needless prejudices. The uh, game was played in Oakland in 1965. The uh, Senior Bowl in Mobile, Alabama was integrated, although the organizers really didn't want to do it. And uh, in 1965, the American Football League wanted to go into New Orleans. It wanted to put a franchise in there. And uh, Lamar Hunt, and Bud Adams, got uh, Dave Dixon, who is the local organizer, to say everything's cool, everything's going to be great. Civil Rights Act signed into law by Johnson uh, back in July. Uh, the players are going to be greeted with open arms. We want a football team here. We're going to show you we want a football team. And it's all going to be great, except it wasn't. Uh, the 22 African-American players uh, who were represented the American Football League in the All-Star game, flew into New Orleans. Um, and their teammates, their white teammates, flew into New Orleans. The white teammates got cabs. The black teammates did not. See, uh, Gilchrist actually did get a cab because under Jim Crow traditions in New Orleans, Cookie Gilchrist could go into a cab if he went in with a white guy and the white guy would take responsibility for whatever action Cookie Gilchrist did. The white guy in this case was the Buffalo Bills quarterback, Jack Kemp, his teammate, who is also the head of the American Football League Players Association and a guy who I knew for about 30 years. So Gilchrist was okay. He got a cap. His other teammates, they didn't get a cap. Uh, in the American Football League, back in those days, Black players and white players were equal, as you could see from the program from the 1963 All-Star Game. Uh, you could see the two coaches, Pop Ivory and Henry, Hank Schramm. Okay, they're white guys, but Charlie Hennigan, Len Dawson, Jim Kokla, Bud McFadden, uh, and Larry Grantham, they're all white guys. Uh, Cookie Gilchrist, Fred Williamson, and Earl Faison, they're African-Americans. 37% uh, of the program are African-Americans. And there was a reason why uh, in the American Football League, because at the time, the league was the only league to truly embrace African-American athletes as an equal on the field with white players. Uh, I talked to the later of Cross, who uh, was a friend of mine who just passed away uh, 
about two months ago, and uh, Irv and I uh, last year it was it was COVID started out, and we were talking, and uh, he said, "How you doing?" I said, "I'm fine. How are you doing?" He said, "I'm 79 years old, aches and pains, just trying to stay away from COVID." Um, he said, uh, "How's how is the speaking going?" I said, "Oh, speaking's going great." He said, "What'd you just do?" I said, "The Super Bowl in New Orleans." He said, "Hey, hang on a second, hang on a second. Did you talk about the quota?" I said, of course I talked about the quota, the quota for African-Americans per team in the National Football League as late as 1961. Uh, and Irv said, give me a second, give me a second. Let me, let me think about this for a second. And he does. He said, OK, we had Tim Brown, Ted Dean, Clarence Peaks, me. There you go. Four. We got the four roommates, 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 roommates. Hey, four per team. Absolutely right. My rookie year with the Eagles in 1961. The NFL scouts went to watch players from the big time schools and conferences. The AFL looked for players with a different background. They needed players. So they went to Grambling and they went to Bethune Cookman. They went to Prairie View and North Carolina AT and Morgan State and Southern University and AM College. And they found players. And those players were really, really, really good and should have made it in the NFL, except the NFL had the quota system. Ironically, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 destroyed black college football programs as the best players could finally attend the big schools, whether it's Alabama or Old Miss or LSU or Tennessee or Texas or Oklahoma or Arkansas or Georgia or Florida or Florida State or the University of Miami. They could go there now. And the uh, traditional black football college program suffered right after that. That's my friend Abner Haynes. Abner is about 83 years old. He lives in Dallas. He was the captain of the uh, Dallas Texans in 1961, told me all kinds of stories. He wanted me to write a book with him. I said, but I'm not that kind of writer. Uh, you really need a guy who could go deep into your career. He was the first African-American college football player to play regularly at uh, Texas, uh, at Texas was, yeah, he went to um, North Texas University and um, captain of the Dallas Texans, all-star American Football League 1965. Uh, as he told me one day, Abner, he said, Lamar Hunt told us before going to New Orleans, name, rank, and serial number, Abner Haynes, running back, Kansas City Chiefs, reason I'm here, American Football League All-Star Game. Abner was stuck at the airport because African-Americans couldn't get cabs unless you had a white guy with us. Um, so uh, somebody calls Jack Kemp, who's the head of the Players Association, uh, saying, we're stuck here, do something. Well, Kemp calls Bud Adams, who owns the Houston Oilers. He calls the governor of Louisiana. He calls the mayor of New Orleans. They send the color cabs out, the color cabs out to pick up people like Abner Haynes. So Haynes is telling me the story going from the airport to the Hotel Roosevelt. And he says that uh, he gets the cab ride. He and David Grayson, his teammate, defensive back with the Kansas City Chiefs, check in. And then they walk to the elevator. And it was one of these old elevators that um, you know, was a crank elevator. Somebody sat in a chair opened the fence, the door swung open, and people went in. And he was telling me there was an elderly woman who was operating the elevator. And uh, he looks up and she says to them, hey, monkeys, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And name, rank, and serial number. And this is Abner. The rest of this is Abner. They had a woman operating the elevator, and she said, you monkeys, come on in. Get to the back. Finally, we had about 10 or 12 guys in my room. We're talking sensibly. We're going to stay together. This was just another test. Uh, we had no leverage. We weren't playing for money, but we were playing for progress. Football players took the lead. I said, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. I said, how about Randolph and FDR in 1941? How about Rosa Parks? Uh, but he was correct. The football players did take the lead. When you think of Walter Beach, uh, when you think about the six Raiders players, they took the lead. Places like Atlanta, New Orleans, Miami were death holes. Dave Grayson couldn't get a drink at the bar. 
our white teammates in New Orleans were there for us. And there is Jack Kemp, and there is me in 1978, May of 1978, interviewing Kemp, long past uh, his years as the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills. It was Congressman Jack Kemp at that time from Western New York, and he was running for president. He was explaining to me his platform. This is 1978. He's going to run in 1980. And uh, we had a relationship for 31 years, Jack and I. Uh, and uh, Jack looked at that picture. I showed it to him years later, and he looked at me. He said, what happened to your hair? And I said, Jack, what happened to your wig? It's white now. There is Jack and my son in 2003, uh, Arizona Biltmore. My son is 17. Jack gave him his first underage drink that I knew of. Um, Jack is our guy. I said, Jack, he's 17. Uh, shut up. He's 17. It's a religious ceremony. Drink ahead. Jack Kemp. Uh, Jack was instrumental in that boycott of that game. Haynes said, one of the things we, the AFL, needed was the unity of the white players and black players for our new league. When the white players, Jack Kemp, Jerry Mays, who was our Kansas City defensive leader, four or five other guys heard about what was happening, their character showed, and my teammates were looking after me. Here's a guy who was very upset. He was the promoter, Dave Dixon. This all happens over about a 33-hour period. And Dave Dixon is fuming that the African-American players decide to boycott the game, kill any chance that New Orleans gets an American Football League team. And by default, the National Football League is no longer interested in Houston because things were that bad in the, on the ground in 1965. Dixon told the New York Times, the boycotters had unjustly sullied New Orleans' reputation, complaining their militant action would not only damage the city, but would greatly retard efforts by men of goodwill of both races to achieve harmony. So New Orleans is on the outside looking in. They don't get an American Football League. Meanwhile, the American Football League gets a new TV deal from NBC stuff with money from NBC. They go out, they sign Joe Namath, they sign John Ewart, they sign a whole bunch of other players. The NFL is signing players and there's a battle for the players and the money keeps going up and up and up. And uh, the NFL people led by Tech Schramm, I know if you're Giants fans, you don't want to hear this, but Tech Schramm was with the Dallas Cowboys, but you know, it's, hey, we're only here having a talk. Uh, but anyway, Tex meets with Lamar Hunt, and they figure they got to do something before both leagues spend themselves into oblivion. Uh, but New Orleans is on the outside looking in, and eventually New Orleans would become a political porn. pawn. The Super Bowl would rise out of the ashes of the New Orleans boycott once the NFL and the AFL announced their merger plans. The AFL and the NFL did announce that merger plan on June 8th, 1966, but the two ent entities could not become one without express written consent of their parents. In this case, the House of Representatives and the United States Senate, because they needed an antitrust exemption from Congress. And there's the guy who is going to get it for them, Alvin P, uh, Alvin Roy, Pete Rosell, Oris Cosell called him Alvin Rosell. Uh, and that's me with a tie on and Rosell, 1986. This is Fortune Magazine, the United States Football League, National Football League antitrust uh, case down in the Southern District of New York. Peter Leisure, the uh, judge there. And uh, Rosell is a you know, he's a guy who's been around by this point, 1966. This is his seventh year or is in his seventh year as the commissioner of the NFL. And uh, after Lamar Hunt and Tech Schramm shake hands, uh, it's up to Pete Rosell to get the merger. The American Football League commissioner at that time, Al Davis, is told thanks, but no thanks. You're gone. We're letting Pete handle the job. Uh, Pete was an old hand by this point. Uh, a commissioner is a hardened political lobbyist, uh, John McMullen, uh, who um, owned the New Jersey Devils, used to have Hazel Gluck down in 
Trenton as uh, his uh, lobbyist to make sure he could get whatever he could from the New Jersey state legislature or the governor. Uh, he wanted to get an arena in Hoboken. He never got that from Christy Whitman. Uh, and that was a long story. And I heard about that from an old man. Anyway, the NFL commissioner uh, was, he knew his way around Capitol Hill by the summer of 1966. Uh, this guy, this guy is a key guy uh, to uh, any of Roselle's plans. He's a manual seller. He probably was elected to uh, the House in, during the time of the War of 1812, well, seriously, 1920. And uh, back in 1961, Roselle was looking at the American Football League, looking at Major League Baseball, and uh, he's got some envy because the American Football League got all eight of their teams uh, as one, sold it as an entity to uh, ABC, a deal brokered by a guy by the name of Jay Michaels. Uh, you might know his son, uh, Alan, Alan, Alan Michaels, who is the, uh, or you better know him as Al Michaels, the uh, host of or the announcer on Sunday Night Football. Anyway, so Roselle lobbies uh, Manuel Seller. He wants to get a limited antitrust exemption so he could get what the AFL has, although they flew under the radar illegally, but what the baseball has, where they could sell all of their franchises as one to a TV network, and they could do that because they got an antitrust exemption from the Supreme Court of the United States in 1922. But uh, he's got to go. He went to a judge and the judge said, you can't do that. Uh, go to Congress. And he went to Congress. It was the judge was named Alan Grimm in Philadelphia. And so he lobbies uh, Seller. And within two days, Seller's got this house legislation. Hey, you know what? Take all 14 of your franchises, sell them as one to a TV network. The bill goes up to the Senate. Estes Keith Howard, who's from Tennessee, the senator, runs it right through the Senate and it gets to John Kennedy's desk and he signs the Sports Broadcast Act of 1961 into law September 30th. And that allowed the NFL to bundle its 14 franchises, sell a package of games as one to a TV network. He was hoping either CBS or NBC would bite. CBS and NBC uh, were biting, but CBS had the better offer. The law helped propel the NFL into a different economic orbit. They got a lot of money from CBS. And the other thing it did, it equalized TV money, whereas the New York Giants, who had the biggest TV market, um, had new, all of New England and all of upstate New York into New Jersey. I guess Princeton was kind of the cutoff uh, with the Eagles territory. Uh, they got the same amount of money for their games as the, as the Green Bay Packers, the smallest market in the NFL. And then it became, and any given Sunday, anybody could win because all the teams were equal as far as revenue because of TV. These are two of the most unlikely people you would ever think that put together the Super Bowl. On the left, Louisiana Senator Russell Long. On the right, Lyndon Johnson. Neither uh, the Louisiana Democrat uh, Senator Russell Long, who was the Senate Majority Whip, the chairman of the Senate Financial Committee, nor Congressman Hale Boggs, were very excited about this planned merger because New Orleans didn't have a team. And you know, they asked Roselle, well, what benefit do we get out of this? Um, we don't get any benefit out of it. Well, Roselle said, well, you know, they have 15 teams. Um, or they have nine teams, we have 15 teams, we've got 24 teams, it's not enough players, we're not going to expand, uh, we'd like to help you out, but we can help you out, uh, but maybe in the future, but can I count on your vote? And Long says no, and Boggs says no. And if Long's saying no, then Alabama's saying no, and Mississippi's saying no, and Tennessee is saying no, Arkansas is saying no, because he had that kind of clout, and if Boggs is saying no, well, the same thing goes on in the House of Representatives. So uh, Roselle has a problem here because he's got to convince these two guys. These are the two key guys that this thing is good. Um, so they go back to the drawing board and they're talking and they said, hmm, let's see. Well, maybe, just maybe, let's see if we can move some parts around. Hey, Sonny Whirlwood, he worked at MCA. He worked with uh, Lou Wasserman. Lou Wasserman ran MCA. Uh, and uh, Sonny, who lived in New Jersey, who was the Rutgers graduate. Uh, Sonny, maybe we could convince him. He, you know, after all, he was once Elizabeth Taylor's PR guy. Maybe we could convince him. And he's got Joe Namath 
and Joe wants to be an actor and he's good looking and he's personable and he's the face of the league. We can put him in Hollywood. We can put him in Hollywood. Now let's try to convince Worldwind to move. So originally they thought they could do this. Convince Sonny Worldwind, convince Leon Hess, convince Phil Islin, move the Jets. And remember those guys also own Bomith Raceway, uh, the racetrack, move the Jets to Los Angeles. They got name it. World One knows his way around showbiz. Hey, let's see if we could do that. And then Daniel Reeves. Well, let's throw him some money and we'll have him take his Rams franchise to San Diego. And then we'll pick up the San Diego Chargers. Baron Hilton owns them. And he's got business interests in New Orleans and that might work out for him. Uh, so that takes care of that. And then we don't want 24 teams in 22 cities. Uh, so we want to get uh, the Jets out of New York, and we want to get the Oakland Raiders at the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, so let's see if we could get them up to Seattle or Portland. Well, it sounds good, right? 24 teams, 24 cities. We get Namath in Hollywood, Werblin in Hollywood. They're promoters anyway. Uh, Hess used to sit on the board of directors of ABC TV. That, that'll work, but it won't. Uh, Roselle and, and other officials went to see their buddy, Emmanuel Seller, but uh, Seller has a problem. He's from Brooklyn, and the next, next district is where Shea Stadium is located in Queens. And uh, Seller knows the Brooklyn Dodgers left only about nine years earlier. And um, he's got a lot of Jets fans who like going to Shea Stadium in Brooklyn. Uh, they could take the subway, a little long to take subway, but they take subway, take the LIRR, they could take a bus or they could drive the huge parking lots there. And uh, there are a lot of votes and a lot of people might remember Emanuel Seller didn't save the Jets. So, uh, and also Emanuel Seller said, hey, I did you a solid in 1961. I got that uh, sports broadcast thing through the house. Uh, so Seller says, uh, no, 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 not so fast. Uh, no teams are gonna be moved because of the merger which means that uh, it's back to square one. How do we get into New Orleans? This was uh, Mardi Gras two years ago, the play after, uh, or the play that uh, was pass interference that probably present, prevented New Orleans from going to the Super Bowl that year. Uh, this guy at the Mardi Gras was still upset about that. Screw that, fire truck crew 2019, hot nuts. But it's back to New Orleans. And uh, Roselle tells his owners, I can't do anything with Emanuel Seller. And the owners say, well, you know what? Uh, just give him a franchise. Just give him a franchise. Tell Emanuel, tell Russell Long, we're going to give you the franchise. And so uh, Roselle and the NFL owners relented. They work out a deal with Hale Boggs. Hale Boggs is really the father of the New Orleans Saints football team. Um, and Bog signs off on it and he says, okay, we will give you an antitrust exemption and we will have a team in New Orleans uh, 10 days after we give you that antitrust exemption, you better give us a team. And that's exactly what happened. The two competitors got an antitrust exemption so they can merge, add it on to the anti-inflation tax bill. October 21st, 1966, but uh, there's a slight problem with timing. 10 days later is Halloween. You're not going to announce a team in Halloween in New Orleans. Uh, so you wait to the next day, All Saints Day. And if you ever wondered why your Ford automobile was not very good in the 1970s, this letter may have something to do with it. Uh, this is from William Clay Ford, one of the uh, uh, people running the Ford Auto Company, the owner of the Detroit Lions. And it reads as follows. The Honorable Gerald R. Ford Jr., House of Representatives, Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. Ford, Congressman Ford, dear Mr. Ford, a sincere thank you for your able, able assistance in bringing about congressional approval of the NFL-AFL merger. The passage of this bill will now allow the merger plans to go ahead full steam. Uh, important also is that the first championship game between the two leagues will now be played for real. It's gonna be played for real in January. So on behalf of our groups, uh, we say thank you for your um, support. 
William Clay Ford. It was, should have been Congressman Ford. And they're playing for real. They're playing for real. And this letter says they're playing for real because they got a merger because they gave a team to New Orleans. And there's Hale Boggs. The NFL did award its 16th franchise to New Orleans on November 1st, 1966 on All Saints Day. Johnson signs the bill into law on November 8th, 1966. That is the pen he used to create what we now know as the Super Bowl. That pen is at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Oh, there's a lot of money exchange. Uh, originally, I had a book called um, the, the Coal Miners Game, but my original intention was calling the book uh, Cash on the Barrelhead because that's what the NFL is all about. The league pocketed an $8 million expansion fee from the New Orleans owner, John Meekham. One of his partners was Dave Dixon. And that was split between the 15 owners, about $475,000 each. Big money in 1966. Additionally, Wellington Mara and Tim Mara, the Giants owners, got $10 million out of Warblin and Islin and uh, Hess uh, because the New York Jets ownership which really it wasn't. It was the New York Titans ownership when Harry Wismer invaded the New York Giants territory. Uh, Wayne Valley, the Oakland Raiders owner, handed over $8 million to uh, the San Francisco uh, 49ers owners, uh, the Morbido family. Uh, they too invaded uh, the San Francisco territory. And then, uh, so right away, you're talking about each NFL owner got a million dollars as a thank you. Uh, for this merger from New Orleans uh, and then Cincinnati. And then the uh, Giants ownership got about $11 million and the Raiders ownership got about $9 million. Big money back then because the AFL also said, well, we'll give you the $7.5 million Cincinnati expansion fee. NFL owners stuffed the money in their pockets. Now, got a question for you. You can answer this. Uh, did Vince Lombardi ever win the Super Bowl? Yes or no? Did Vince Lombardi ever win the Super Bowl? I'll give you a couple of seconds if you want to type that in. Yes or no? Did he ever win the Super Bowl? Play the Jeopardy Think song. Da, 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 da. Here we go. Did Lombardi ever win the Super Bowl? Uh, well, the answer is wrong. Uh, the answer is he never won the Super Bowl because the Super Bowl was not called the Super Bowl in 1967 or 1968. Uh, let's talk about Mickey Mouse for a second. Now, when I was a kid, and some of you New Jersey Devil fans, if you, any of them are out there, uh, might remember when Mickey Ma when Wayne Gretzky called uh, the New Jersey Devils back in 1983 or so, because they were so bad, a Mickey Mouse organization. And when I was growing up as a kid, and some of you might remember that Mickey Mouse, you know, they, they say, oh, that's a Mickey Mouse thing. That's a Mickey Mouse thing. Like it's a second rate, third rate thing. Now, about 15 years ago, Comcast tried to buy out uh, Disney uh, and control ESPN and ABC and all that. They offered $66 billion to buy them out. They couldn't buy them out. Disney raised that money. And so every time I hear about Mickey Mouse being a second, second rate thing, do you know how much that rodent is really worth? He's worth billions and billions of dollars. Uh, the house the mouse built, Disney. Uh, Green Bay and Kansas City played in the first American Football League, National Football League World Championship game. That was January 15th, 1967. Lombardi, the Green Bay coach, didn't want to play the game. His team had already won the NFL championship, and he referred to the AFL as the Mickey Mouse League. Why would he want to play a team from the Mickey Mouse League? Uh, this Los Angeles is a big, big event team, uh, city. Big, big event city. I mean, that's what they live for. The Lakers, when the Lakers, when that basketball team is good. Um, when uh, the Dodgers when that team is good, they fill up. Even the Anaheim Angels or the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim fill up. Uh, when the Los Angeles Kings won the Stanley Cup, filled up. But if you don't win in L.A., you don't fill up. And the Super Bowl was not considered, and it wasn't the Super Bowl. It was the uh, American Football League, National Football League, World Championship game was not considered a big deal by people in L.A. or the TV networks. The game held in 
the 94,000 seat Los Angeles Coliseum. And think about it, the tickets, 12, 10, and six bucks, 12, 10, and six bucks. Even if you account for inflation, you couldn't pay for parking at the Super Bowl now on that six buck level. So it's cheap, 33,000 empty seats. The last time a Super Bowl or the world championship game was not sold out. Lombardi, who is the pride of New Jersey, he must be, he has a uh, service stop named after him by the Meadowlands. First one in Jersey or last one in Jersey, Vince Lombardi rest area. He also taught in Englewood, lived in Englewood for a while. The pride of CBS, Bill Paley. Bill Paley impressed upon Lombardi. He was playing for the pride of CBS. He was playing for the pride of Gilligan, for Lucille Ball, for Jack Benny, for John Charles Daly on What's My Line, and Bud Collier on To Tell the Truth, and Old Iron Pants, Walter Cronkite, uh, and Arnold the Pig, and Jethro on the Beverly Hillbillies. He's playing for their pride, their pride. He's playing for the pride of CBS. The first game played January 15, 1967, 26 days after the absolute final approval of the merger. All the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed. Uh, CBS and NBC televised it using the same television feed, different announcers, different advertisers. And Paley leaned on Lombardi. He was coaching for CBS. Uh, but it wasn't what you think. Um, back in those days, tapes were expensive, and the only things that seemed to be kept around in those days on video were the Kennedy was the Kennedy assassination, and Ed Sullivan kept some of his tapes, uh, but a lot of tapes were just erased over. Uh, you don't see game shows, uh, and there's a game show network, very many of them from the 1960s. Uh, nobody wanted to store them. Nobody thought 54 year years later anybody would want to watch the first game between Kansas City and Green Bay. Uh, no complete copies have surfaced. About seven, eight years ago, um, the National Football League put out a $10 million reward. No questions asked for anybody who had a complete game, a complete game. And they thought, well, maybe, just maybe because we sent the tapes out to Korea, uh, to Vietnam, to Germany, uh, wherever American Air Force or Navy or Army or Marine bases were around the world, they got to see the game on Armed Forces Radio. So maybe, just maybe, uh, somebody stuffed tapes in their duffel bag, went home, threw it up in the attic, and they've been sitting there. Well, $10 million, and seven years later, apparently nobody, nobody had the tapes in their duffel bags or up in their attic. So Neither Paley nor uh, Sarnoff at NBC decided this was any big deal, this game. Uh, probably uh, they sent uh, the tapes back around and they taped, um, I don't know, Hollywood Squares on there or, or the match game on uh, NBC or As the World Turns on uh, CBS or Password. Yeah, they didn't keep the tapes. Frank Gifford, uh, Jerry Kramer in 1988. Kramer, who is a guard, number 64 with the Green Bay Packers, uh, the guy who uh, was the guy who led the way where Bart Starr went over in the ice bowl back the year earlier. Uh, in 1988, uh, Kramer and I were talking about the first game. And he says, I, I was talking to Frank Gifford years ago. By the way, I keep all my interviews here on things like this. All my interviews are there, although they have now changed to something like that, flash drives. Anyway, uh, I was talking to Frank Gifford years ago, and he mentioned that he announced the first Super Bowl. Gifford said he was fairly cool, calm, and relaxed. He went over to put his arm on Vince's shoulder. Lombardi was shaking like a leaf. Vince Lombardi's favorite player ever that he coached was Gifford when Lombardi was, for lack of a better uh, term, the offensive coordinator of the Giants in the mid-1950s. Gifford told uh, Kramer, uh, that really made me nervous. Gifford, of course, was a CBS announcer, represented the NFL, and Lombardi was playing for him. So the other way around, Gifford playing for Lombardi. Money, 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 NBC. CBS and NBC charged $42,000 for a 30-second commercial. The two networks paid $9.5 million to televise the game. The leagues couldn't even agree on what ball to use. Green Bay, on offense, they used the Wilson, 
Wilson Duke football, named after Wellington Merritt, the Giants owner, the Duke, the Duke of Wellington. They named the football after him. When Kansas City had the ball, they used the AFL sanction Spalding. Spalding, if you grew up in New York City, Spalding, J5V ball. And there were rivals. It was just more than on the field. It was Ford Motors against Chrysler Motors. Ford had a team in the NFL, William Clay Ford. Uh, they were the sponsor on CBS. Chrysler was the sponsor on NBC. It was CBS against NBC, the NFL establishment. Sports writers like Sports Illustrated's Tex Mall, who could never find a good thing to say about the AFL, against the AFL announcer, Kurt Gowdy. They nearly came to blows during the Namath game. It wasn't just a game. But that would subside, and uh, I hate to say this around Giants fans, but I will. Texas Schramm, uh, the all-purpose guy with the, I hate to say this, Dallas Cowboys in this neck of the woods. But as Tex told me once, the Super Bowl kind of put the icing on the cake and the interest in the NFL kept rolling until it was the most popular spectator sport in the United States. Uh, Tex had some problems with hyperbole sometimes. I like all the time. By the way, it was Tex who named the Dallas Cowboys America's team after the Kennedy assassination. January 5th, 1967, that's where the game was played. That's where I was standing outside the place. And uh, football was the most popular spectator sport in the United States by 1965, two years before that game. The Super Bowl name, some people, Actually, it's only one person, Al Davis. Al Davis, Raiders in the uh, second uh, American Football League, National Football League World Championship game, started calling the game the Super Bowl in 1968. Uh, I once talked to Pete Rozelle about the name, and he said, you know, no one could think of a proper name. He thought Lamar Hunt's idea of calling it the Super Bowl was corny. And I looked at him, corny? Yeah, corny. So you were born in 1926. He said, yeah, corny, like, you know, we, we had all those terms like razzle-dazzle, corny back in the day. I said, corny, I haven't heard anybody say that since 1968. And Roselle said, well, I'm old. <laughs> corny. Uh, in uh, July 25th, 1966, letter Roselle to Pete Roselle, Lamar Hunt wrote, I have kiddingly called it the Super Bowl, which obviously can be approved upon. It never was. Uh, I talked to Lamar. This was in the late 1990s, and uh, we were out in uh, Phoenix, and uh, I was doing an interview, and we are talking about the name. And Lamar, of course, founded the American Football League, and he said uh, it was one of the spur-of-the-moment things. No one ever said, what are we going to call it? It's just one of those things that just happened to come out of the mouth. It's not too inspired. But was it? Hmm. It might have been. See, uh, back in the mid-1960s, when I was nine years old and 10 years old, I had this great toy, and some of you might have had that great toy, too. It was a little ball, and you threw it against the wall and it bounced all over the place, and you chased it, and it bounced. It was crazy bounces all over the place. It'd go up, it'd go down, it'd go sideways, it'd go this, it'd go that. And uh, Lamar Hunt is uh, home one day, and he's watching his children play with this toy, a ball, when he first uttered the words. Super Bowl. Lamar, they each had a Super Bowl that my wife had given to them. They were always talking about them. And I just used the expression Super Bowl. It was an accidental thing. Hmm. So he says, and there it is, the Super Bowl. I had one. It was blue. It was great. It bounced all over the place. And you chased it. And here I'm a kid in Woodside, Queens. No, we didn't have money. And Lamar's kids, they probably lived in a palatial estate outside of Dallas. They had money, but we had something in common, the Super Bowl. Um, it was a whammo Super Bowl. And its shelf life was considerably less than the Super Bowl. It was a toy made of Zectron. A chemical engineer, Norman Stingley, found that when formed at 50,000 pounds of pressure, Zectron becomes uncontrollably bouncy. Whammo began producing a ball made of Zectron in 1964. And we used to see the commercials on the kids shows on Channel 5 and Channel 11 in New York City back then. After only a few years though, the double top secret, it was a double top secret. 
The double top secret formula for Zetron was copied by Whammo's competitors in the Super Bowl, bounced out of favor. It was out of production by 1976. That is me, my buddy Bruce Morton, who uh, jumps on Super Bowl talks uh, during January and February with me, talking about Joe Namath. And this is the 20th anniversary of the New York Jets beating the Baltimore Colts in the Super Bowl that made it the event that it is today, the February holiday, except when there's COVID around, the February holiday, the celebration of nothing in February except the football game. Um, winners write history. Winners write the history. Losers seldom write history. So you probably don't know much about Lou Michaels, but he was the ultimate Super Bowl loser. Lou Michaels was a kicker with the Baltimore Colts. His brother, Walt Michaels, was the defensive coordinator of the New York Jets. And Lou Michaels and Joe Namath's pass cross in a bar in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Lou Michaels and I talked about this, obviously, many years ago. He passed away many years ago. And um, here we are. We're at a bar. And Michaels is relaxing with some of his Baltimore teammates, and he sees Joe Namath walk in. Joe Namath walks in. He spots Lou Michaels, who's the spinning image of his brother, Walt, the Jets' defensive coordinator. He leaves with Jim Hudson, and then they come back. Oh, it's like a scene from wrestling today or Muhammad Ali. I must say, Joe is a very cocky individual. I never expected that from Joe when he walked into the place. He had a fur coat on. I'll never forget it. A fur coat down in Miami. And he points over to me instead of saying, hi, I'm Joe Namath. I thought he was going to introduce himself and say hello. Points over to me and says, we are going to kick the out of you and I'm going to do it. The next day, Joe has a news conference. And it's in Fort Lauderdale. The Jets were training at the New York Yankees facility in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, Joe decides he's going to have some beach time, like any other good New Yorker who goes down to Florida, to Miami, or Fort Lauderdale uh, for the winter to get out of the cold. And uh, so he has a news conference. And uh, there's Larry Fox there, and there's Paul Zimmerman there. And, uh, and Joe, well, he <laughs> Joe. Sadie, Sadie, do you think that's him? Says Sadie from the Bronx. I don't know, Thelma. We could walk over there and we could see. Oh, yeah, let's walk over there. And they walk over there. Oh, it's you. It's you. It's really. Oh, wait till I tell the girls back home. We met you. You were on the beach. We met you. Oh, if we only had a camera, we could take a picture. Well, there were cameras there. And that picture is in the New York Daily News the next day. And it's in the New York Times. And it's in the New York Post. And it's in the suburban newspapers. Yeah, those two women did get their picture taken with Joe. Joe's having a news conference. And he tells everybody there, we're going to win the game. Uh, well, everybody there except that guy in blue who seems to not care about it. And that woman back there who can't be bothered with the fact that Joe Namath is there. Uh, Joe says to everybody, they're going to win the game. And they do. The Jets-Baltimore game is the turning point. Namath guaranteed the Jets were going to win. He delivered. And because of Namath, and Namath, as Cosell would say, hey, why is Joe Willie Namath in the Hall of Fame? Because he won one game. And the name changed to Super Bowl III. The Super Bowl begins to take on a new life. Super Bowl III, flimsy pregame show featuring a marching band, Florida A&M. The Apollo 8 astronauts, Frank Borman, William Anders, Jim Lovell, just circled the moon two weeks earlier. They lead the crowd in a rousing rendition of the Pledge of Allegiance. National anthem performed by a trumpet player, Lloyd Geisler. Uh, the trumpet player... Uh, for the first game in Los Angeles was Al Hurt. Uh, no singers, none of that trapping. It was just a football game with a couple things thrown in, the Florida A&M marching band, the halftime show. But back to Lou Michaels. Well, he's insulted by name. His team loses the game, and there's one more insult. He makes a, a bet with his brother, Walt, the Jets defensive coordinator, and there's a base of $8,000, winner or loser. You take home $8,000, uh, the winner gets $5,000 more. And the brothers make a bet on who's going to win. And that extra $5,000, well, neither one's going to keep. They're going to go to the church in Swearsville, Pennsylvania, where the two of them grew up. They like the Padre, but the church 
church needs some some work it needs some work and so the brothers promise well you'll get the five thousand dollars well uh, lou gets home walt gets home walt has got all these jets world championship stuff all over the place Lou gets home, and uh, the, the Padre said, you know, Walt hasn't given me the $5,000 yet. And he never gave him the five grand. Lou didn't bring it up with Walt. Lou gave them the five grand. So not only does he lose the game, not only is he get insulted by Namath, but his brother backs out on a bet, and uh, he's supposed to get $8,000. He's got to give 5000 away. So Lou Michaels ends up with just $3,000. He is the ultimate loser. And again, History is never written by the losers. Lou Michaels has his story. Jets win, arguably the most important in NFL history. It puts the AFL on par with the established league. The NFL has a hot property. Super Bowl would go on to become a national holiday and the most TV, watched TV event of the year. Lou Michaels had no idea that a chance barroom showdown with Namath, January 5th, 1969, would lay the foundation in turning the Super Bowl into a national obsession. And uh, that guy, Tom Brady, won the Super Bowl this year. And uh, that guy, Bruce Arians, uh, is holding the Lombardi Trophy. Uh, Vince Lombardi would die in 1970. The league would name the Super Bowl trophy after him following his death. Hence, Vince Lombardi never won a Super Bowl. Uh, Lombardi, talking about Irv Cross, uh, which you probably don't know about Lombardi, he was a civil rights pioneer. In 1967, Green Bay had 13 black athletes, including the all pros, Willie Davis, Willie Wood, Dave Robinson, Herb Adderley, and Bob Jeter. Uh, I'm mentioned in the book about Adderley and Dave Robinson called Lombardi's left side. Um, Lombardi was a civil rights activist. He personally desegregated Green Bay. And he had gay players on this team. His brother, Tom, a priest, was gay. Ah, the Queen Mary. It's been a long time since I've been on the Queen Mary. I was on there in October of 2015. So I was speaking on a ship behind it, a princess ship. The Queen Mary has a place in Super Bowl party history because it was the first place where the beautiful people, all, everybody, anybody who is anybody in Hollywood showed up, including my friend, the late Shelley Saltman, who told me stories about the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary, uh, the Super Bowl, takes on a new personality, Super Bowl Seven, a party on the Queen Mary in Long Beach, becomes a social event in January of 1973 and starts a new Super Bowl era, party surrounding the game. Uh, people said, hey, if those people can party, why not us? And there's a party. And it's party time. Uh, I work with John Mammon between 1988 and 2003. There's me on the left and John in the middle and Dennis Steele on the right uh, at uh, Sink Sound in Manhattan. We were uh, taping one of his shows and uh, John was probably giving me a hard time at that point, which he always did, but it was a lovable hard time. Nothing personal because I gave him a hard time as well. And poor Dennis, well, Dennis was just there observing everything. Uh, let's do this Madden stuff. Hey, it's party time. Uh, uh, you got the you got the dogs there. Yeah, the dogs are there. And then you got the, you got your burgers there. You got your wings there. You got your cake there. That's all good. You got your dip. You got your dip. Uh, and then you got your cups there. And you got something to drink. Oh, good. You got the ketchup and mustard there. Good. Where's the rye bread? Where's the bread? We need rye bread because I got to have a ketchup mustard on rye bread. Madden did have ketchup and mustard on rye bread. I could attest to that. But it's party time. In every community in the United States is touched by the Super Bowl. Stores sell big screen TVs. Supermarkets have super sales. And the Beer Institute, there is such a thing as the Beer Institute. Lori Levy at one time was the uh, lobbyist for them. They're in Washington, D.C. And we sat down, we talked about the Super Bowl and beer and food and all that one day. And uh, she told me how big a uh, party the Super Bowl really is. Second biggest food consumption day of the year, non-COVID years, behind Thanksgiving. And the big screen TVs, they go off the walls, uh, off the shelves in Costco and Amazon, wherever you need a big screen TV, you can get one. And according to the National Electronics Dealers Association, the sales of large screen TVs increased 500% during Super Bowl week because there's a demand for the TV sets for the big game. Beer here, beer here. Lori, the Beer Institute has data that suggests the Super Bowl is one of the seven biggest sales days of the year. 
behind only Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, and the 4th of July. And there's some um, data that suggests that the Super Bowl now is a bigger day than New Year's Eve. Uh, newspapers, whatever's left of them, sell advertising for special Super Bowl second sections. Uh, the Super Bowl is a moneymaker for supermarkets, department stores, bars, snack food makers, breweries, restaurants. It's also the springboard for companies to start their annual TV, radio, and print advertising campaigns. The actual game, yeah, maybe the second or third place. In fact, you know what? I bet you if I ask you who played in the Super Bowl, you probably would have to think, really think, to find out who played in the Super Bowl, which was two months ago. Tom Brady won. Uh, anyway, and the NFL wants non-football fans to watch this thing. Why do they want non-football fans to watch this thing? Because they could sell commercials and get more money. And the commercials are a major part of the entertainment package. Uh, this one over at the old Mount Vernon Stadium is still the all-time commercial. It's the kid. It's mean Joe Green. He offers Joe Green the Coke. And they fall in love with one another, and uh, the world's a happier place. I like to teach the world to sing. Oh, he did a pantyhose commercial. Remember Joe? Joe loved wearing Hanes pantyhose. And a couple of years ago, a woman said to me, oh, you're just showing his top. Can you please show his legs? I said, why? They're all filled with scars. He's had knee replacements. But I gave them that, and the women seemed to like that. Pantyhose. He was wearing pantyhose. Oh, I just turned 65 the other day and he hasn't come to my house. Last Friday, I expected him at my door to sell Medicare coverage, Medicare helpline. Jimmy Walsh, who's been his agent since 1964, got him that. He didn't show up at my house. I feel very upset about that. Some of the best of the commercials, Mean Joe Green and Coke. Sledgehammer, Apple computers. Uh, 1996, Pepsi, the Coke guy takes a Pepsi. 1998, Tabasco sauce, mosquito. 1998, Doritos 3D, Budweiser, Clydesdales. Budweiser sat out this year and the money that they would normally pay uh, for a 30-second spot during uh, the Super Bowl went uh, for COVID-19 vaccine education. Uh, Reebok, Terry Tate, office linebacker, and the very young at that point, she was merely a kid, 88 years old, Snickers commercial, with Betty White. Uh, the politics of the Super Bowl don't go away. Uh, in 1988, the uh, St. Louis Cardinals owner, Bill Bidwell, moves his team from St. Louis to Phoenix, to Tempe, Arizona, and he steps into a problem. Uh, the uh, NFL owners uh, awarded Bidwell the 1993 Super Bowl because he wasn't drawing people in Tempe. And they basically said, okay, you know, you could buy Super Bowl seats, but you got to get into a lottery and you got to be a season ticket holder. Uh, there was a problem in Arizona with that 1963, 1993 Super Bowl. Uh, the governor, Evan Meacham, canceled the Martin Luther King holiday in 1987. Bidwell took his team to Tempe in 1988, and he gets there, and there's a boycott led by Stevie Wonder. Uh, companies are bypassing uh, Arizona for a place for a convention, and the NFL gets involved. MLK and the big game. Uh, the battle is on. In 1989, the state legislature passed legislation to create a king holiday. Opponents say, mm -mm, we're going to get enough signatures to get the voters in the state to decide on whether or not to honor king, November 1990. The uh, petitions came through, and there were enough names on there to get this thing on the ballot. The NFL said, well, if you vote against King, we're going to pull the game out of Tempe in 1993. Uh, the Arizona voters said no. They uh, said we're not going to have the, the holiday. The NFL pulled Super Bowl 27 from Tempe, moved it to the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. It was a redo in 1992, the presidential election, Bush, Clinton, and Ross Perot. And um, the NFL told voters in Arizona, say yes, and we'll give you the next game, 1996. The voters said yes. In March of 1993, Tempe got the 1996 game. Uh, the anthem, 
Anthem's a big deal. Was this anthem real or on tape? Give me a couple seconds if you want to uh, answer if this thing was on tape or real. Okay, time's up, pens down, and I will give you the answer from Jim Stieg, a guy who I've known for a very long time. In early January, this is 1991, our coordinator of the Super Bowl pregame activities, Bob Best, produced a recording of the Florida Orchestra for national anthem producer Ricky Minor. A week later, Minor flew to Los Angeles to have Whitney record the vocal track. Amazingly, it was done in one take. And amazingly, that was all lip sync. Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson. Oh, the 2004 Super Bowl. Anybody want to guess who played in the 2004 Super Bowl in Houston? Um, I'll give you the final score. It was 32-29. The game was played in Houston. And if you want to put it in there, I'll give you three seconds if you want to put in who played in that game. One, two, three. Well, New England beat Carolina 32 to 29, but nobody remembers that. But they remember this, the costume malfunction, which led to uh, all sorts of stuff afterwards. Uh, Janet Jackson's costume malfunction at halftime of the 2004 game caused the political football and changed how television and radio presented programming. ABC showing of Saving Private Ryan was impacted. The FCC, the Federal Communications Acts, uh, it was 3-2, Republicans against Democrats. Uh, whoever runs, whoever holds the Oval Office, it was George uh, W. Bush at the time, gets three on the FCC and the opposing party gets two, the minority party at that time. Uh, if you remember correctly, Justin Timberlake grabs Janet Jackson in the dress routine, accidentally forced her dress to open, revealed one of her breasts. That nine sixteenths of a second left an impression. Now, wait a second. What do you mean nine sixteenths of a second? Didn't everybody see it? Well, nobody saw it, except because of AOL instant messaging, because of Yahoo Messenger, and because of Hotmail, People started talking. Do you see what I saw? No, I didn't see. Do you have uh, Do you have TiVo? Yeah, I have TiVo. Oh, go back to the halftime show on TiVo. Oh, okay. What am I looking for? Just slow it down. Slow it down. Slow it down. Slow. There it is. There's the frame. You could see everything. And boy, you could see everything. One frame. It was blurry. Politicians derided Viacom CBS and Viacom's MTV unit, which produced the halftime show, and somehow blamed them. And uh, Janet Jackson, they never blamed Justin Timberlake. He never got any blame at all. He's the one who pulled it, but he never got any blame. It was all on Janet Jackson. Within 15 hours, politicians gathered on the steps of the Capitol in Washington, pointing their finger at Jackson and CBS for promoting something immoral. The hammer came down on CBS. The Republican-led FCC majority got involved. Find Viacom CBS $550,000 and changed in decency rules. Viacom CBS fought the fines for seven years and won. Spent more money on lawyers than the fines. What was the principle of it? Meanwhile, Saving Private Ryan. That's going to be on Easter Sunday in 2004 on ABC, a Steven Spielberg film with Tom Hanks, also starring Edward Burns, Matt Damon, Tom Sizemore. The man is the mission. The mission is the man. But uh, the mission in for a number of ABC, Disney ABC affiliates, was not to show Private Ryan because they did not want to get fined. Uh, the FCC raised the amount stations and networks could be docked for what was termed questionable images. That certainly was in Private Ryan. In Dirty Words, that certainly was in as well. But it was replicating a war scene. 2004, television stations are scared off by the prospect of fines. 66 ABC TV affiliates, most of them in the southern United States, did not show the movie Saving Private Ryan because of foul language concerns. Stations didn't want to risk a fine. Saving Pri Private Ryan won five Academy Awards following the uh, 1998 film release. It had been on ABC twice before, Easter 2001, Easter 2002. Military veterans groups were furious with the stations, and even Disney and ABC 
They were upset too. We'll pay the fines. Just put it on. We'll pay the fines. Um, but they didn't. However, the FCC ignored a foul language complaint one in 2002. Nobody cared except the station's owners. So there were safe acts at the Super Bowl halftime show. McCartney, Paul McCartney, arrested in 1980 in Tokyo for pot, spent nine days in jail. Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club uh, band album. Um, well, uh, fueled by uh, speedballs, among other things. Uh, well, that's Keith Richards. Rolling Stone, Safe Act 2006. The Who, two members dead from drug-related problems. They're, they're too were there. Bruce Springsteen, Mariah Carey, Michael Jackson, Madonna, Prince, Justin Timberlake twice, Beyonce, Jennifer Lopez, Janet Jackson, Paul McCartney, The Stones, The Who, Whitney Houston, Prince, Lady Gaga, have performed the event's pregame show and halftime ceremonies. There's no more up with people. The Super Bowl has come a long way, a very long way. It rose out of the ashes of the civil rights movement uh, back in the 1960s. And what I didn't say about those guys in New Orleans, they got no help from Martin Luther King, no help from the uh, Southern uh, uh, Christian Leadership Conference, no help from CORE, no help from Stokely Carmichael, no, hope from, no uh, help from SNCC. They were on their own. Those guys all put their careers on the line. Jack Kemp, the quarterback from the Buffalo Bills, he put two careers on the line, his football career and his political career. He was a Barry Goldwater delegate in Western New York during the 1964 presidential campaign when Goldwater uh, was against Lyndon Johnson. Super Bowl is far more than a game. It's a happening. It's a cultural event. It's also a very, very, very politically fueled event as well. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me. And if you have any questions, any comments, feel free, because uh, at this point, uh, the floor is all yours. Questions or comments? Criticisms? So one of the questions, and you addressed it a little bit, um, what was what did halftime entertainment look like more in the beginning? We obviously, you know, we, we, a lot of us remember the Janet Jackson thing. It, how, you know, when did it, how did it start and when did it really like take started, off and be the thing? It started changing with Michael Jackson in uh, the mid um, 1980s. Um, he was, um, he, he, had, he had the big album at the time, Thriller. And they brought him in, but uh, the acts were, you know, they were inconsequential. Uh, there was a salute to the big bands somewhere in the 1970s. There was up with people, uh, but it started when the NFL really figured this thing out that it was more entertainment than a football game. Um, that's when it started. Um, and that started in the 1980s when they said, hey, wait a minute. You know, those commercials are a big deal. Um, and the commercials were a big deal. And people were going to parties. We got to entertain them with more than just the football game. And um, so that started. And then the whole thing with Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake kind of changed it around. Although it's a bit more risque than it was when Paul McCartney was there or the Stones. Although those guys had a past also, which seemed to be ignored. So I said, if anyone else has any other questions, I think. Or comments. Need, or comments, any feedback, um, anything that is new that you did not realize, you know, that's wants you to learn more about it. Oh, thank you for such an enlightening presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate that. See People should anything. talk more about the Super Bowl's past, particularly what's going on uh, today uh, and... with, with, you know, what happened last summer and what may happen subsequently this summer so it's an interesting past and uh the nfl the only thing that uh the nfl refers to about uh what happened in 65 is there's a small presentation at the pro football hall of fame in canton uh where they honor those guys and there was i think it was the i i think it was a 30 for 30 on espn where they talked about uh, or it might have been an hbo special where they got the guys and they were 40 years hence from there 
whoever was left, uh, where they talked about uh, the situation in New Orleans and how American Football League players were activists. I mean, I hear people today say, hey, you can't mix sports and politics with the Atlanta thing. And uh, thank you, guest. I appreciate that. Uh, and you can't mix sports and politics. But in 1961, you had Walter Beach, and that was the first protest. And he played with Boston. And coincidentally, in that um, September or October period, when the Boston Celtics, the NBA, uh, were playing a preseason game in um, Lexington, Kentucky, uh, there were a couple of Boston players. Sam Jones was one of them. And I forgot who the other one was who did not get served, Satch Sanders, it's with the other ones, they did not get served at a Lexington um, restaurant and the Celtics led by Bill Russell um, staged a one game sit down strike, but uh, they weren't gonna cut Bill Russell nor were they gonna cut Satch Sanders or Sam Jones. Um, but uh, political protest in sports um, started really in 1961 uh, with Walter Beach with Bill Russell, and then you had the, the guys down in Mobile. So sports and politics do mix. Well, we have to log off for the evening, but Evan, thank you so much for sharing these great stories and things that you know people may not have known about, and maybe people will be more inspired to dig into more of that history, especially with the sports and politics, which I know is something that you definitely find interesting with all the talks that you do. Do you have a website or anywhere else? Yeah, that you I can just, follow you? They can just look me up, uh, just look up my name and under speaker and they'll find uh, my website. Uh, thank you, Mama. I'm happy that you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, the, the conjunction of sports politics and business has been in my life since I covered strikes and you saw me at uh, the USFL NFL trial in Fortune Magazine. In fact, there's a lot of pictures of me during that trial that's floating around the internet that I didn't even know existed. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's what I do. Um, you know, that's been my job as a journalist and, you know, I just keep going. I mean, until I can't. Well, thank you so much for your time and everyone be safe and be well. Thank you for joining us for this week's Encore presentation. To join us for live programs or to learn more about the East Brunswick Public Library visit our website at ebpl.org.